Ready? Good evening, and welcome to this special lecture. I'm Professor Janet Nelson, Deputy Vice Chancellor and Vice President for Research and Innovation at the University of Newcastle. Whether you're here in the university's Great Hall or attending remotely online, it is my great pleasure to welcome you this evening. Our event here at the Callahan campus is being held on the traditional lands of the Pambalon clan of the Awabakal people. I will soon be joined on stage by Mr. John Russell, sorry, Rob Russell, to deliver a formal acknowledgement of country. But at this time, I too would like to convey my respects to the traditional owners of the land and the elders past and present. I also extend a warm welcome to our guests of honor, the Honorable Malcolm Turnbull, Australia's 29th Prime Minister, and Ms. Lucy Turnbull AO. We were delighted to host Mr. and Mrs. Turnbull on campus this afternoon, and we really appreciate the time and interest in our institution. Thank you. I also acknowledge our panelists and speakers this evening, who I will introduce later, as well as our entire audience. I'd like to give a special thanks to Kay Frazier, Mayor Lake Macquarie, Councillor Christine Buckley, Deputy Mayor Lake Macquarie, Councillor Declan Clausen, Deputy Mayor of City of Newcastle, other leaders of our community, university council members, and all executives, staff, alumni, students, and other guests. Thank you all for joining us. We're gathered here tonight to hear from Mr. Turnbull and our panelists on a topic of cutting energy emissions and energy de costs decarbonizing for our prosperous future. This timely discussion for our nation and particularly for our region, as we consider our future energy and economic future. I look forward to what will be a very thought-provoking and relevant lecture and a panel discussion. But before we move to tonight's events, I'd like to do a few housekeeping reminders. This is actually the first public event we've hosted on campus since the pandemic took hold, and we're delighted to offer this opportunity to our community. You've seen that we've had to do a few things differently. This is all part of our COVID planning to ensure that we can host you in a safe and socially distant manner. So we really want to thank you all for your cooperation in this regard. Uh, I need to point out that bathrooms are located outside the Great Hall in the lobby area. In the event of an evacuation, you'll need to please proceed to your nearest exits and move away from the building. University staff and ushers will escort you there. If you did not complete a login code when, or a login when you came in, we ask you to do so before you leave to record your attendance. We do ask that you remain seated for the entire event and refrain from mingling between tables. This may seem a bit antisocial, but it is part of our social distancing protocol. Our ushers and social distancing champions that you see in pink vests are here to help us on and to keep us safe. If for any reason you do need to leave in the middle of the event, please exit via door two in the back. Following um, a little bit about the flow of tonight, I'd like to share with you the sequence of uh, the great program we have lined up for you. As I mentioned, we'll convince with an acknowledgement of country as an important way for us to recognize our indigenous communities and our history. I'll then introduce Mr. Turnbull to deliver his remarks. Following the lecture, I'll invite the panelists and moderator to join Mr. Turnbull on stage for deeper discussions. You will see us making some changes to the stage at that point in the program. You will have an opportunity to ask questions of our panel. Unfortunately, during, due to COVID, we cannot offer a roving microphone, so you'll find a QR code on each of your tables or on your screen for those of you watching remotely that will take you to a Microsoft form we will gather these questions, try to group similar questions together, and then the forum will go live at the end of the, the lecture. Following the panel discussion, Professor Alex Zielinski, AO, Vice Chancellor and President of the University of Newcastle, will offer a vote of thanks. We'll then have our speakers depart the auditorium, and that will mark the conclusion of the event. We do ask that you remain seated once formalities have concluded. We have to carefully manage the exit of people to make sure there's no crowding, and we do thank you for your patience in these unusual times. So to get underway, I'm pleased to introduce Mr. Rob Russell to the stage to deliver the acknowledgement of country. Mr. Russell is the Chief Executive Officer of the Wabakal Local Aboriginal Land Council. He's also the chairperson of the Aboriginal Advisory Group for the Hunter Local Land Services. 
We also proudly recognize Mr. Russell as an alumnus and a great champion for our institution, and we are delighted that he could join us for this important event. Please welcome Rob Russell. Uh, thank you, everybody. Duman Nayin Narakalu Kiranan Bariadin. We remember and respect the ancestors who cared for and nurtured this country. As an Aboriginal man, uh, I'm a Gomorrah descendant from around Bogabri, Gunnedah and Baraba, um, from the Namoi River country, which is my mother's country. I'd like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the traditional owners of this land on which we meet today, the ancient Awabakal people. Country is the essence of our laws, of our customs and, and of our life discipline. I acknowledge the Awabakal people as the traditional custodians of this land and pay my respects to their elders past and present. And I particularly pay my respects to the young Aboriginal people, the elders of the future and our emerging leaders. Elders are the keepers of my knowledge and my law, and it is through their resolve, dedication and commitment to maintaining this knowledge and law that I am able to be here today and to participate in this ceremony with you. Today I'm off country, so I'm following the protocol of acknowledging country. Only an Aboriginal elder or representative of an elder may welcome you to country, but anyone may acknowledge country. You do not need to be Aboriginal. And I encourage you all to take part in this ceremony as it's a means of edifying and promoting Aboriginal culture wherever you go. Both ceremonies are long-standing greetings used by Aboriginal people for thousands of years to welcome travellers, to greet visitors crossing traditional boundaries, to introduce the tribal leaders and to make sure that visitors are aware of uh, what becomes acceptable behaviour. Uh, NAIDOC 2020 is always was, always will be. We have been occupying and caring for this country for 65,000 years or more. We've crisscrossed this continent in the footsteps of our ancestors, sharing knowledge, seeking marriage, pursuing trade and celebrating ceremony. NAIDOC is an opportunity for all Australians to celebrate the rich diversity, history and achievements of Aboriginal people. We are the oldest continuing culture on the planet and we have earned our place as the original, original inhabitants of this continent. So think about what this continent was like before 1788. We already had our own sciences. We had navigation derived from astronomy and geography. We had agriculture li linked to meteorology, botany, chemistry. We had engineering li linked to physics, hydrology and fluid dynamics. We had advanced conservation and land management skills, knowledge which is now being keenly sought. Our country is part of us. Our social and emotional well-being is directly linked to relationships with country, with extended family and to our kinship. NAIDOC is a great opportunity to inspire others to recognise and acknowledge the strength and the importance of these connections, generating greater value and pride in our identity through a wider understanding of Aboriginal culture and ways of seeing the world and of acting accordingly, because we all want to belong. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rob, for that wonderful acknowledgement and providing a great context for the discussions to come. As we think about the importance of our indigenous cultures and our history in this region, I would like to take an opportunity to draw your attention to a new piece of art that is on display at the Great Hall to my left, and I hope we're showing it on the screen at home too. This piece was created by one of our Indigenous Visual Communication School students, Jasmine Couchin. Jasmine is a proud Barkinji Malagapa artist with a passion for telling the stories of diverse groups through her work. In this piece, Jasmine tells the story of Aboriginal students at the university and our efforts to build both cultural knowledge and understanding across the institution through our education, research and community engagement. 
It is a magnificent piece which we will proudly present for the first time to the public this evening. So well done, Jasmine. And now it is my great privilege to introduce our keynote speaker and to share a few notes about his remarkable career and his contributions to this nation. The Honorable Malcolm Turnbull was the 29th Prime Minister of Australia. Prior to entering politics, he enjoyed a successful career as a lawyer, an investment banker, and a journalist. He commenced his journalistic career by studying law at the University of Sydney and at Oxford University, where he studied under Rhodes Scholarship. It was during his time at Oxford that he married his wife, Lucy. Mrs. Turnbull A.O. is the former Lord Mayor of Sydney and former Commissioner of the Greater Sydney Commission. We're delighted to have Mrs. Turnbull here today, too. Following his time at Oxford, Mr. Turnbull returned to Australia to practice law. He quickly established a reputation as an effective advocate, most notably when he successfully defended former MI5 agent Peter Wright against the British government in the Spycatcher trial. Mr. Turnbull established an investment banking firm in 1987 where he specialized in the media and technology sectors. He worked with media leaders of the time, including Rupert Murdoch, Kerry Packer, Conrad Black, and Bob Maxwell. He co-founded the first big Australian internet company, Oz Email Limited, enlisting it on the NASDAQ in 1996 and selling it to WorldCom three years later. He joined Goldman Sachs in 1997, becoming a partner of the firm the following year, and led their Australian business for four years before moving into politics. Mr. Turnbull entered the Australia Parliament in 2004. He has served as Minister of the Environment and Water Resources, Minister for Communications, and as Prime Minister from 2015 to 18. During his time as Prime Minister, Mr. Turnbull delivered economic growth and an innovative agenda that led to record job creation. His government legalized same-sex marriage, reformed school funding, and embarked on the largest peacetime expansion and modernization of Australian Defence Forces, including commissioning 54 new naval vessels. He established a series of city deals where the three tiers of governments agree on common goals and work together to realize them. And as part of the Western Sydney City Deal, he commenced the construction of the new airport for Sydney. Mr. Turnbull's great interest and deep interest in energy issues and renewable energy was evident during his time in office and continues today. The construction of Snowy Hydro 2.0 pumped hydro scheme started under his leadership. He also identified opportunity for similar pump storage system in Tasmania. Since leaving politics, Mr. Turnbull has returned to his business career and regularly speaks at global conferences. We're really delighted to be able to share his insights today on this topic that is of great importance to the future of Australia, particularly our region, speaking on the cutting energy emissions and the cost, energy costs, decarbonizing for our prosperous future. Just a few reflections. Here in the Hunter, we do have tremendous energy capability. Our region produces 63% of the state's electricity. We have a large energy workforce with the the sector employing 47,000 people indirectly, and some of the very largest state's energy users are located right here in the Hunter. We have considerable energy assets, not to mention the Port of Newcastle, access to gas, transmission, and infrastructure. This means issues around energy costs, new generation energy production, and climate change have significant bearing on our economy and the livelihood of our communities. So we welcome this discussion and Mr. Turnbull's perspective on the challenges and the opportunities ahead, and how we can secure ongoing prosperity of our regions. It is my honor to present a guest of such esteem and distinction, and please join me in welcoming the Honorable Malcolm Turnbull. Right. Well, good afternoon and thank you very much for that very generous introduction. Uh, it's a, really, it's a great honour uh, and privilege for, for me and Lucy to be visiting the university today and I want to thank you so much for uh, inviting us, Vice-Chancellor. 
I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, the Pambalong clan of the Awabakal people, and I want to thank especially Rob Russell. and I'm just inspired by the energy, uh, no pun intended, and the innovation that I've seen uh, everywhere here today. Um, as some of you, as, as, as you disclosed in my introduction, which was very generous, but it did disclose that I'm a lawyer, uh, can't hide that, uh, but I'm, I, I don't, I, I've always been, uh, I guess, an amateur uh, engineer. To be honest, I've found uh, water easier to understand than electrical engineering, uh, but the, hence the interest in hydropower, I suppose. But I just, you know, every encounter I've had with Newcastle University over the years uh, just reinforces the, you know, my understanding that the tradition of engineering and innovation runs so deep in this community and this university. It is really inspiring, and I just want to compliment you on it. Um, it's wonderful to be speaking to you in person. I mean, wow. This is the first time I have given an address face to face rather than over Zoom since the outbreak of the COVID pandemic earlier in the year. Now, this uh, pandemic has inflicted enormous suffering around the world, as we know. Uh, well, well over a million people dead, uh, killed, uh, you know, about 20% of them in the United States alone, of course. Uh, but it is a huge economic disruption uh, and damage. But it is also brought home to governments around the world that challenges and problems of this scale and magnitude require united, swift and decisive action. And nowhere is this more evident than in our ongoing fight against global warming. Only months ago, more than 200 fires burned over 18 million hectares of our country. The air in our capital cities was the worst quality in the world. At least 34 Australians were killed, thousands of homes and buildings were destroyed, and more than a billion mammals, birds and reptiles were estimated to have been incinerated, with several species feared to have been wiped out altogether. Hundreds of Australians were huddling on beaches in skies black with smoke in the middle of the day dark in the middle of the day with that massive smoke uh, coverage, uh, waiting to be evacuated by the Navy. The savage consequences of global war warming were upon us. Now, more than ever before, our priority must be to accelerate the transformation to renewables so that we generate all of our electricity from zero emission sources. It's not the only measure, but a key measure in the battle against global warming is to in deliver our energy, our electricity from zero emission sources, which we can do and can do at the same time as having cheaper electricity and equally reliable electricity, and then that coupled with an electrification of industry and society generally takes you a, not all the way, but a very long way to achieving the, the target that we must have is just to reach net zero emissions as soon as possible. Now, I believe that there is nowhere in Australia a greater opportunity to lead that charge than here in the Hunter, Australia's leading regional economy. Now, coal has been synonymous with the Hunter Valley for 200 years. Welsh miners named many of the local towns like Swansea and Aberdeer and so many others, as you know. Uh, this, in the solidarity of the Miners' Chapel was the foundation of the Australian labour movement. Uh, my father, Bruce, grew up in Cessnock. His first job was as an electrician in the mines. His high school magazine, Then and Now, is called The Black Diamond. 
Each year, the Hunter region produces most of the 160 million tonnes of coal, which is exported from ships uh, here in Newcastle to markets in Japan, South Korea, China, Taiwan and other places. The plentiful coal and the energy it produced has also attracted manufacturing and energy intensive industry to the region, aluminium. It brought steel making to Newcastle too, now part of the city's history. When I was a boy, my grandparents, by then living at Wanji Wanji, across the road from Bill Dobell, I might add, who, who we believe touched up one or two of Nana Turnbull's paintings, which appear to have a slightly higher quality than the others. But that's another, <laughs> that's another story. But um, Fred and Top, my grandparents, uh, would admiringly point out the young men who had won the greatest accolade, a cadetship at BHP. So BHP was Newcastle, steel was Newcastle. You still have the steelers. Now BHP has left, but coal mining remains. The city prospered without BHP. It prospered in large part because it be has become a knowledge economy. And the university, again, is a huge part of that, as indeed has been the CSIRO. Coal mining provides over 15,000 jobs for those directly in the industry and many thousands more indirectly. But there's a lot more to the hunter than coal mining. Uh, wine making and tourism have prospered, incongruously perhaps, alongside vast open-cut moonscapes left by the coal miners. Further up the valley, where Lucy and I have grown cattle and sheep for over 40 years, uh, there is the largest thoroughbred breeding centre in the world outside of Kentucky. Scone's Veterinary Clinic is the largest in the Southern Hemisphere, and needless to say, it's not all small animals. Uh, not only that, it has provided uh, coal mining for the livelihoods of thousands of people. Uh, thousands of people. So it's been a huge part of the life of this community. Now we live in remarkable times. They're defined by economic and social change unprecedented in both their scale and pace. In other words, we've never seen so much change so quickly in all of human history. And so disruption is the new normal. And in that environment, you have to make volatility your friend. If you don't, it will become your foe. You've got to, you can't change the environment. We cannot change the tenor of the times. So we've got to be smart enough and agile enough to make these changing times our friend, to take advantage of them. And that's why I've always been passionately committed to innovation, which is the great driver of productivity. So as Prime Minister, my first new economic initiative was to launch the National Innovation and Science Agenda in November 2015. Uh, now, it's this sentiment, this passion for, pro for innovation, is one that is shared by you here at the University of Newcastle. On our tour today, and thank you again, Vice-Chancellor, uh, we were able to meet with your researchers, professors and students who are all at the cutting edge of the technologies vital to securing our future. Renewable energy and its storage, green hydrogen and so much more. Uh, we were also delighted uh, to discuss with some of the faculty the efforts made to bring more women into STEM. Again, one of the key agenda items in the National Innovation and Science Agenda. And I just want to applaud you for the work of Hunter Wise, uh, in, which is your initiative in this region. Uh, now, this same spirit of innovation was present at the Melt Manufacturing Incubator I visited here last year with the, the mayor of uh, the, the mayor of Lake Macquarie was there as we last, that's where we last met. So, the, you know, there's a great tradition here, uh, innovation, engineering, technical excellence. Now, throughout history, though, we've always heard voices seeking to oppose innovation. Those that are anxious and frightened of the new who prefer to hide under the doona in the face of change. You cannot hide. Change is coming, whether we are prepared for it or not. Now, the transition from coal will happen. 
That is, that is a given. The environmental necessity to stop burning fossil fuels is so apparent. And at the same time, we know that renewables, variable renewable energy, solar or wind, uh, plus storage is the cheapest form of electricity. I'll come back to some numbers on that in a minute. But so this is going to happen. That transition from coal will happen. It's a certainty. But what won't happen unless we make it happen is the hunter transforming itself into a clean energy powerhouse with all of the jobs and opportunities that entails. Now, leaders should focus on people and communities and defend them. The long-term interests of the men and women who work in the coal industry, let alone their children, is not in coal. It's in having good, well-paid jobs in safe communities with clean air and water on a planet that has stopped the relentless self-destruction that is global warming. Now, there are plenty of voices in politics and in the media, particularly that part owned by Rupert Murdoch, who will dismiss global warming as a hoax, claiming that by doing so, they're defending jobs in the coal industry today. Some of them may be sincere, but believe me, they are all misguided. Coal is on the way out. What we need is to recognise that change is coming and make sure the hunter has more and better jobs in the future. Those who deny change in defence of today's jobs are denying all of us and our children the jobs of the future. Now, when I was the Environment Minister in 2007 in John Howard's government, that was that dangerous radical Prime Minister whose policy included an emissions trading scheme. You may remember that, that old lefty. Uh, renewables were vastly more expensive than conventional forms of generation. And the argument in favour of subsidising them was not really to reduce emissions, but to provide the economic pull through, or in other words, help facilitate more demand for the relevant renewable technologies, more R&D, more learning through doing, and economies of scale. Now, whether this was the cause or it was coincidental, the reality is the relative cost of new generation has shifted, as I said, in favour of renewables and storage. The cost of solar photovoltaics is declining every year, 13% last year alone on a, you know, it's dollars or now cents per watt basis, and over 90% over the last eight years. That's a dramatic change. And we'll continue to see standard solar panels increase in energy efficiency by another 50% in the years to come. Now, batteries are seeing similar increases in efficiency and affordability. AEMO, that's the Australian Energy Market Operators, latest estimates show that by 2030, new solar backed with six hours of pumped hydro as being $40 a megawatt hour cheaper than new black coal, even without a carbon price. So the key element, however, and this is, I think, a very important point, is not what the long-term cost of electricity is, or the LCOE for renewables, because that's really a banker's measure. It's important if you're raising the finance. But the fact is that they are zero marginal cost generators, meaning the additional cost of generating an extra megawatt hour is zero because they have no fuel cost. Now, you know, what this obviously means is that, and we're seeing this already today, you'll see this with the solar panels on your home if you have them, uh, and I think over two and a half million Australian households do already. Uh, there are times of day when electricity supply is well in excess of demand and times uh, when the reverse is true. Uh, hence the need for storage, and that's why I'm so pleased to see so much work being done here on that subject. Now, with every new solar panel installed, whether on a home or on a vast solar farm, the viability of continuous coal-fired generation is undermined. Now, when I was PM, I used to say to my colleagues, we don't want to be the coal party or even the solar panel party but rather the cheap, reliable and clean energy party, guided by engineering and economics, not ideology and idiocy. And the economics is so very clearly on the side of renewables, not coal. I mean, consider this. For the first time on record, the world's combined coal power capacity has fallen 
as more coal plants are being shut down faster than new ones being opened. Japan, for example, one of our big customers for coal, has committed to closing more than 100 plants by 2030. Japanese companies, including Osaka Gas, Tokyo Gas, Kyushu Electric and Itamitsu, have also abandoned plans to build coal plants, meaning up to 30 per cent of planned investment in coal power in Japan has been scrapped since 2016, with a focus instead on offshore wind power and renewable energy programs. All of the major customers for our export coal have committed to net zero emissions by 2050 or earlier. It is remarkable that our government, uh, led by my successor, Mr Morrison, is so reluctant to make a similar commitment. The world must, and I believe will, stop burning coal if we're to avoid the worst consequences of global warming, and the sooner the better. Now, the way forward. The, the Hunter can and should become a green energy hub. Let me paint the big picture. You have a skilled workforce with deep expertise in energy and engineering. That is the Hunter's best resource. In fact, it's Australia's best resource. As I often used to say as PM, our best resource is walking, uh, walking around on top of the earth, not the minerals and uh, other matter, other, uh, you know, um, hydrocarbons beneath it. However, the transmission infrastructure into the Hunter is of enormous value and shouldn't be wasted as coal-fired generation shuts down. Thousands of hectares of unrehabilitated or barely rehabilitated land scarred by mining could be covered with solar panels. There's plenty of potential for local pumped hydro. AGL's been working on a proposal near Musselbrook, and of course you have in Glenbourne Dam a reservoir with a capacity one and a half times the size of Sydney Harbour and plenty of surrounding landscape to enable the construction of a second higher or lower reservoir with a substantial difference in elevation. But just a word of warning on pump hydro, it is currently at least the most cost effective way to store large amounts of electricity for periods in excess of eight hours or more. And this is an important point, I might say. Uh, there is, batteries are being deployed rapidly and they're providing very valuable uh, firming, uh, sometimes almost at a, at a tactical level, and of course, providing all of those services of frequency control, ancillary services that are needed as our network moves to one where the electricity is provided by variable renewables, inverter-based generators, as opposed to the big spinning machines of, you know, the, the turbines, steam turbines, which of course have so much inertia uh, that they're able to maintain frequency more readily. So all of that, the batteries are going to play a bigger and bigger part. But there is going to be a need to ensure that we have sufficient long-term storage. Sometimes it's called seasonal storage in the literature. Now, you know, Snowy 2.0 is, a, is a, like a standout example of that. It can generate 2,000, it will when it's built, it will be able to generate 2,000 megawatts for, I think, seven and a half days, 175 hours, uh, without repumping. But there are not too many sites like that in Australia. We are a big, flat, dry continent. So, uh, but, it, but it's a very important, this is a very important point to bear in mind. But here's the, here is the key warning on pumped hydro. We have got to get on and build it. Now, you can roll out solar panels and wind farms in months. Pumped hydro takes years because of the civil works and environmental approvals. Moore's law does not apply to digging holes. Really important point. It has, a, has applications in the water industry, Kevin, also has applications in telecommunications. So you could go on about that for a long time. Now, there's been a lot of outstanding work done, especially by uh, on mapping the opportunities for off-river pumped hydro, especially by Andy Blakers at the ANU, and he's identified many sites in this area, in the Hunter, but I am really concerned that the only substantial pumped hydro project which is actually being built today in Australia is Snowy 2.0, the project 
that I got started when I was PM. Now that was, if I may say so, an example of government not just thinking ahead, but getting on with the job. So we need to do more. So I welcome some of the recent announcements made by the New South Wales government. They certainly recognise the need for more storage, but we've got to get on and build it. You know, there's always excuses not to do it and obstacles and so forth, but you've got to get in and build it because the, the variable generation can be built, as I said, in months, but the storage that you need to make it reliable uh, takes years. So it's, there is no time to waste. Now, with plentiful clean energy, the hunter could, for example, return to steel making using green steel, uh, making green steel with green hydrogen instead of coal. And I know there is work being done here uh, at the university, and we visited some of the labs working on green hydrogen. Uh, the, the, all of that legacy infrastructure, transmission, port, rail, brownfield land, makes for the perfect environment for a new clean energy economy. The Energy Renaissance lithium-ion battery factory chose the Hunter exactly for that reason. And your own laboratories here are developing even more efficient batteries. Uh, MGA Thermal is another product of this university storing energy as thermal heat. So you, you, you are, amongst all of you here at the university, you have the solution, you're working on the solutions. Uh, but it's got to be brought together. Uh, it needs a plan, it needs leadership and it needs advocacy. Uh, beyond zero emissions, I'm sure the group I'm sure you're all familiar with has a large and committed group of, of volunteers for the most part who've worked, already worked thousands of hours to diverse, to, on a plan to diversify the hunter economy. Uh, only today a new collaboration of unions and environmental groups, the Hunter Jobs Alliance, has been formed to advocate and plan for this transition. With determined leadership, the hunter can emerge from this energy transition stronger than ever. But it has to be planned. Engineering and economics, that is Newcastle's forte. That is the hunter's forte, rather than the ideology and idiocy that has characterised too much of the political debate. So let's pause for a moment and imagine what the hunter might look like in the future, one by design, that we choose to create for ourselves. Transmission corridors that once took coal-fired power now carry clean energy. Solar, wind, pumped hydro storage, utility-scale batteries, and green hydrogen underpin industry, making up a reliable energy system. The children in Musselbrook and Singleton will not have to breathe in coal dust and sulphur dioxide from the mines and power stations, and their parents will have jobs in industries that thrive with cheap green power. As I said earlier, we're living through one of the most extraordinary periods in human history. The pace and scale of change is faster than ever. That is the nature of our times. There's nothing any of us can do to change that. That's the environment we live in. That's what we're presented with. And we've got to decide whether we want to make that volatility our friend, whether we want to leverage it to succeed, or whether we want to let it wash over us and we'll be left behind. So this is not the time to be faint-hearted or timid with our ambition to rapidly transition to zero emissions. It's an opportunity for people like yourselves, like ourselves, all of us, to be at the forefront of this change. Innovation and new technologies are the means to do it. And you have them here at the University of Newcastle. And so I encourage all of you today to play your part as we move together into this zero emissions, prosperous future, the, the one that we need to preserve our planet, preserve it for our children and our grandchildren and the generations to come. Thank you very much. <laughs> Sit there. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Turnbull, for a wonderful lecture and a really compelling take on our future and our nation. Um, I'm very deeply moved.
There's much more to discuss, and I'm sure our audience will have questions. So I do remind you about the QR code at your table or in the screen for those of you at home. To help dive into these ideas, it is my pleasure to welcome the panel for the next session. I invite our speakers to join the stage with Mr. Turnbull as I introduce them to you. Moderating today's panel is Ms. Alice Thompson, Chief Executive Officer for the Committee of the Hunter. Alice is a leader in public policy with a focus on industry development, urban planning, and regional development. Her career spans the public and private sectors, including as the national lead on cities and regions with KPMG. She also worked as a senior advisor for Mr. Turnbull on cities and infrastructure, so I imagine the exchange of ideas will be familiar. Joining Mr. Turnbull on the panel, we also welcome Professor Alan Broadfoot, the Executive Director of the Newcastle Institute for Energy and Resources. Alan is also the Director of the New South Wales Energy and Resources Knowledge Hub and is a respected leader and facilitator of partnerships and collaborations across the energy industry. We welcome Ms. Sorrell Osborne. Sorrell is the Operations and Commercial Director for Diffuse Energy, a wind technology company that emerged through the research of its founders here at the university. Sorrell has held executive roles with Conversant Media with marketing technology startup Audience Republic. And our final panelist is Dr. Nicholas Jarif, a new Alliance postdoctoral associate with the Priority Research Center for the Frontier Technologies and Utilization here at the university. Nicholas' research is focused on the utility scale energy storage, including hydrogen and batteries. He is a director of the Australian Institute of Energy and has served as an engineer officer in the Royal Australian Navy. We have a great lineup of experts to talk more on the themes we have heard from Mr. Turnbull. And now I hand over to Alice to facilitate the discussion from here and remind you that following the panel discussion, Professor Alex Zielinski, Vice Chancellor and President, will provide a short vote of thanks. So over to you, Alice. Thank you very much, Janet. So one of the things that I really loved working with you and your style of government and prime ministerialship was your optimism and positivity and really raising the ambition. And I think your speech is really perfect for where we're at in the Hunter and what we need to hear despite all of the challenges that we've got. Um, to start with, I totally agree with you. I think that the Hunter can lead, can be a clean energy powerhouse and can actually lead Australia's transition in energy and economy, the decarbonisation of that economy. Alan, I'm just wondering if you could talk us through in a little bit more detail what you consider some of the Hunter's energy capabilities and advantages. Well, historically, I mean, this is about my 45th year of being in business. I can remember the power station down at Cockle Creek. I can remember the state dockyards. I can remember the thousand apprentices being put on at BHP going through their gate every year. But what I saw, I always believed the Hunter, since I can remember it, has been in transition. And what we do is every time there's a transition, we build another level of capability. When we went through the big industrial change of putting in sewerage and dams in the 60s, we built a university to have that transformational change. We built up a world-class TAFE Institute that runs all the way to the border now. So what I said is you can give the conventional answer of we've got the grid structure, we've got the energy intensity industries here, but we've got more than that. It's what Malcolm said is that we've got the skill base, we've got the innovation, we have a capacity to be not just simply the next powerhouse a generation. I think the big challenge for us as a nation is how we use energy. At some point, we've got to get back to the word sustainability. And we can be an engine room of change because it is in our, in our makeup. It is the fact that we have got these large skill workforces and we have a large capital investment in infrastructure. And, and saying that, we do have everything else, the port, the, the, the gr connections of, for the grid. Uh, we have the, the, the capacity to take on new generation, but I think look, we look beyond that. 
Yeah, completely agree. And I think what makes the Hunter different to other places is that we have all of those capabilities and assets in the one place at the same time and at significant scale. And so I think that we certainly can lead the charge on the clean energy economy, which will, of course, um, require public and private sector investment. Sorrel, do we offer a decent value proposition for energy investment? And how does it compare here to other places in Australia? I think it's a fabulous question. I think ultimately, um, decent is underselling. I think we are a lot more uh, than just decent on how we support um, startups and, and certainly energy startups in this region. Um, I grew up in Maitland. I'm a, a proud hunter, um, hunter person, and I spent a lot of time working in Sydney with startups there before now coming back to work um, for Diffuse Energy. And what it's shown me uh, this this move back to the Hunter region to work in startup is that both with the University of Newcastle and any number of other local um, policy makers and supporters is that we are doing a fabulous job, in my opinion, of really giving um, these businesses an opportunity to firstly tap into uh, government grants, government funding, um, and, and go on those sorts of important commercialisation pathways, taking great research and commercialising that, which of course is incredibly important to, um, to the growth of this sector in this region, um, but also allowing for fundamentally for us to showcase that in the Hunter, renewables is good business. And that is incredibly important as well when we are then, and there's any number of um, energy startups from the University of Newcastle and from the Hunter region who are going to venture capitalists and are going to private equity firms and who are able to secure um, really, really strong levels of seed, Series A, pre-seed funding um, because we do come from such a strong background of, of energy foundation um, coming from the Hunter. So I think it's a, a fantastic stepping stone and it's giving us the opportunity to come from a very, very strong energy background as we progress into a very, very strong renewables energy background for the region. Nicholas, I'm wondering if you could tell us about some of the really exciting energy projects that are happening right, right now here in the region. Yeah, um, Mr Turnbull mentioned one, the Musselbrook uh, pumped hydro that's being supported by AGL. Uh, there's another thing that AGL is talking about, a big 500 megawatt battery at the Liddell site, which is pretty exciting for a battery nerd like myself. Um, uh, then there's tremendous opportunities for doing other stuff with energy in this region, and, and one of those is, is hydrogen, which is what I'm looking at now. Uh, and colleagues in my group, the Priority Research Centre, led by Professor Badad Motaderi, uh, are building uh, this virtual gas well system with uh, the APA group and Southern Green Gas, where you take uh, energy from the sun using solar uh, to, to extract water out of the air and also extract carbon dioxide out of the air and then you split the water also using solar power and get hydrogen out and you combine that with the carbon dioxide uh, and you get green methane which you can put into the, the gas network and create this virtual sustainable green gas world anywhere that the sun shines. Fantastic. Um, Malcolm, so as we're leading the charge, the hunter to become Australia's clean energy powerhouse, it needs to have a plan. You said that in your speech, and clearly a plan that's going to cross sectors, cross levels of government, cross LGA boundaries, and cross portfolios within any level of government. Would a city deal style approach uh, benefit the hunter? Yeah, well, it would. I mean, the, Alice, um, you, you, you worked, you and I worked together uh, on the city deal um, schemes, or plans, and, and I mean, I must say, inspired by my uh, wife Lucy, who uh, I have to say, I just want to acknowledge Lucy's understanding of local government, which you know is extensive. Um, my only achievement was to be the first man to be Lady Mayoress of Sydney, so... so <laughs> but I did... Uh, I listened carefully, and uh, the city deals have actually, were actually a, a really good reform uh, of our time in government, because uh, what it did was kind of obvious, which was to get take an area, a city, Western Sydney or Launceston or you know Townsville or, or Newcastle, should the Newcastle and perhaps the Hunter should have should uh, have one. But the idea is to get federal government, state government, local government, major stakeholders like universities, uh, all around the table and actually agree on what they want to achieve. Shock horror. Work, governments working together. And so instead of having various levels of government, uh, all with the best of intentions, going off and 
rather like passing each other like ships in the night. You actually work out what you want to do and you say, right, this is what we want to achieve and you know, you pay this, we'll pay that, they're going to pay something else and you divvy it up. And the Western Sydney City deal is a really good example of that. You know, it's got, it's got you know, you know, an aerotropolis, an airport, uh, new mass transit, you know, and a whole lot of other uh, amenity and infrastructure associated with that. But it's a plan and it fitted in with the Greater Sydney Commission's three cities plan that Luce was so involved with as chief commissioner. But I, I do think I, I think Newcastle and the you know and the Hunter needs a plan. I mean, the, look, here's the thing: you 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 know you can drown in the detail and the minutiae, and if you want to, I mean, that's it, not unimportant. But you've got to be able to see the big picture, and and the big picture is that there is a tra an energy transition going on, and clearly, if you're Heavily invested in the that part of the trans that part of the energy space which is going out, you want to make sure that you're part of the the part part of the new energy uh, technology that is coming in, and and it can all be done, but it does need a plan. It does need coordination. So, yeah, and I and I I think this university could could and should play a leading role in that. I really do. So. Thank you. You have said previously that the only thing holding back our clean energy future, Australia's clean energy future, is politics. Yep. However, businesses and shareholders are talking with their own feet and wallets. They're adopting environmental and performance standards in their own operations, in the products and services that they provide, and certainly investing in new technologies like um, Energy Renaissance, the, the battery gigafactory here in the Hunter. Mm. So what is the role of government in this new world of direct action that isn't necessarily waiting for policy certainty or that bipartisan agreement? on decarbonisation? Well, look, I, I think the political impasse is really a function of the toxic politics inside the coalition. I'm, you know, I, I'm no longer in politics, so I can just be completely blunt with it uh, and speak very plainly. Um, We've read your book now. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, it is, but it's, <laughs> look, I mean, you, you, you were there, Alice, you saw it all. Uh, I mean, essentially, global warming and climate change has become an identity or values issue here in the right of politics and, and also in the United States. And obviously, they're having an election today, tomorrow, you know, uh, to hopefully resolve that. Uh, but the, 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 it, it's crackers. I mean, saying I believe in global warming or I don't believe in global warming is like saying I believe or don't believe in gravity. You know, it's, lud it's ludicrous. It's absolutely ludicrous, barking mad, but boy, it's real. You know, just because something is crazy doesn't mean it's real, by the way. Uh, and so that's the problem. And so I think essentially now effective leadership on energy and the transition has gone, is being held by the states because the Commonwealth cannot, because of this problem in the coalition, uh, you know, and Morrison obviously doesn't want to ignite the right to move on him the way they moved on me and he wants to stay sweet with the Murdoch press and all of that stuff, there's a whole cosy sort of ecosystem going on there, you're just not going to get coherent energy policy out of the federal government anytime soon. It may change if there's a change of administration in Washington and a big shift there. That may, I think, you know, that could have a seismic effect around the world. But anyway, but in New South Wales, certainly, I, everything I see on the energy front indicates a very practical, pragmatic, rational approach. And I think Matt Keane, the minister, is, you know, is, uh, he, seem, you know he, he, he seems to speak a remarkable amount of good sense on energy. Uh, and so I'm you know, really delighted to see that, as does the Premier. So the, 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 but you know, nonetheless, you have to get on and do it. And, and look, I just get back to this fact about pumped hydro. So we all agree that pumped hydro is going to be a big part of the future. I, mean, I don't think anyone in the energy sector disagrees with that. But why is it that there's only one major pumped hydro project being constructed, Snowy 2.0? And the reason is because there's always people who are naysayers with problems and obstacles and vested interests. Snowy 2.0 happened because as Prime Minister I made it happen. You know, that's the, that's the reality. There's no other 
explanation for it. It wouldn't even have been thought of as a project had I not just pushed it and pushed it in the way I did. But that type of pushing and determination needs to be seen elsewhere, otherwise we'll get to the position where we end up without the storage and the firming that we need. Uh, so, you know, I'm just, th this is a, this is a big, this is not just in Australia, by the way, this issue with storage and pumped hydro is an issue in quite a few other jurisdictions as well. Thank you. Now, Sorrell, still on this question of what is the role of, of government here, uh, you're part of the Hunter's very rich uh, startup and, and, and SME ecosystem here. What is it that you're looking from government? What would give you the confidence to invest, expand and create new clean energy jobs? Yeah, so I think certainly, um, and, and as mentioned a couple of times, it is absolutely in inevitable that this is not just going to happen, but is happening. Yep. Um, industry leaders across any number of sectors are demand, you know, and en energy experts, but people are demanding that their customers, their suppliers, uh, their consumers are thinking about how they are approaching a zero carbon um, strategy and, and, and getting to that position. So fundamentally, um, we are doing it, and we are doing it off the back of, of a lot of private investment, a lot of research institutions. Um, and so what we're after with government is simply help us craft a framework that allows us to continue what we're doing, hopefully expedites it, um, and then stop being a blocker, basically. Mm -hmm. I, just, yeah. <laughs> I just think if the, if the market pull is telling you this is inevitable and this is happening, and any number of startups and SMEs are developing off their own backs because of potential government um, policy that is blocking this, but we're still able to get it done and we're still able to take on investment and grow uh, and scale these businesses and these technologies, the writing's on the wall. So what are you going to do about making sure that that it just continues to be a pathway for us. That's, that's really all we ask. We don't need subsidies. Um, as we pointed out, it is a very, very cheap way to fuel our nation uh, using renewables, using all these new technologies, but we just need their, just their sign-off, just their support in, in, a, in a simpler way as that. Mm. So some of the uh, government's investment vehicles like the CEFC and ARENA have been especially important uh, in supporting innovations and the commercialisation of that. Mm -hmm. um, Nicholas, did you want to tell us a little bit about why you think they're really important in the work that you do and the career that you see for yourself going forward? Yeah, uh, institutions in, in general are critically important to democracies and, and modern economies. And so that, that's no exception in the energy space. Um, the Australian Research Council uh, sponsors uh, or funds uh, fundamental research like we do at the universities. Then uh, the Australian Renewable Energy Agency funds the next level in partnership with, with uh, industry uh, and, and businesses like Sorrels. Uh, and, and that project I mentioned before with the APA Group and Southern Green Gas. Uh, and then the Clean Energy Finance Corporation uh, funds the next stage of commercialisation, taking it to scale. Uh, so to, together they fund the whole pipeline from the fundamental research here at universities, then the next stage in partnership with industry, and then, and then the full, the full kit of it. I think it's incredibly important that we've retained them as institutions um, as we face this challenge. Now to get the benefits of being a first mover, you actually have to be out on front. So Alan, can you tell us, is the Hunter and the University on the cutting edge of energy and resources research? And can you give us some examples of innovative partnership uh, research that's being done in partnership with industry um, and the institutions? So that's a two-part answer. I mean, one is recognising the skill sets and the capabilities of the academic um, staff of the University of Newcastle. And then it's one thing I enjoy every day is actually seeing the new discoveries and, and Malcolm was fortunate enough to see that here today. It's more than that. You, you can't on your own create a solution to a global problem because it is a global problem. There's an enormous amount of research around the world being put into, this, into these areas. And that's what a university is. So having a local university in a city, you create a gateway to those, that cutting edge research. And what I get excited on is that innovation is taking the invention, the invention that's happening around the world, and making it uh, regionally relevant, but also translating into an application that will have real benefit to the community. And that's the thing that I recognise with the academics here at the University of Newcastle. They're rapid in their ability to adapt that technology and deploy it into, into the industry sector. 
In terms of some of the collaboration we have, um, we're, on the, on, we're doing research on mobility in terms of application of hydrogen in terms of transport. Um, I'm looking forward to a, maybe a successful announcement uh, later this week about that. Uh, we've got four groups looking at battery storage, um, not only just about lithium ion, but also looking at sustainable battery materials in carbon and, and, and aluminium. We're looking at uh, carbon, new carbon structures for CO2 capture, uh, which is something we shouldn't forget about. And it's not just limited to power stations, it's all about combustion across the, the, the individual sectors. Uh, there's our plastic uh, solar cells. Um, it's about getting an affordability and adaption that can be uh, address the issues that we have, in, especially in, in remote communities and regional areas. I still believe in that we are a regional university, but we're research for regions. We may not have a solution for Sydney, but we certainly have a, a solution for the majority of Australia. And then how do we integrate? And I still think the wicked problem is, is advanced energy integration. I remember as a boy engineer, I was, I was doing a lot of work in automation. They brought this new device out and say, how can you apply that to this? It was called a computer. The CFO, by the way, said, I don't think you'll ever get a, a, a fly. But they invented the internet after that. So remember, with discovery, we're only looking at the lens of where we're at. And we have to be on that forefront and adapt it quickly. We need to be seen as a region of first adopters. And I think that's what the focus should be with our industry partners. Thank you. Now we have over 300 people who have logged in and have been watching this live streamed and we have some, uh, some questions there. I'm going to be using WhatsApp, which I wasn't on before um, until I was in the office of the Prime Minister and we had the tech savvy Gen Y in the office, which was the Prime Minister, basically got us all onto <laughs> the latest little whiz bangs <laughs> and I think it is going to work. Uh, we have a question from Grant Sefton of Hunter Angels. How important is finance to facilitate change in alternative energy innovation, and should the Hunter have its own innovation investment fund? I think that's a, I think that's a really, I was actually just thinking just then uh, that it, the Hunter probably should have its own innovation investment fund. So I think tentatively I would say yes. I think there could be quite some value in that. Um, and uh, because to be able to provide, um, you know, seed, seed capital and maybe some, uh, you know, a round, you know, early stage capital. Uh, the um, that's because it, it helps to have people on the ground uh, in the community, particularly when you're funding uh, businesses from the very startup who actually know the players. You know that that helps uh, because ultimately, you know, ultimately you're backing people. Um, above all else, so yeah, I, th I think that's a, I think that's a, that's a high quality idea. Yeah. Sorrel, what difference would it make to you, noting that um, you've certainly benefited your startup through the uni's integrated innovation network? Mm. Yeah, look, I think um, certainly it would be, would be all ears for that opportunity, as as we, you know, as we have touched upon um, so much about really, really early stage investment is finding great founders and, and, and knowing them and, and their interaction and their you know, commitment to local communities like our own. Um, but there's, very, there's often a very, uh, a very small amount of revenue or no revenue or you know, a bit of a great idea that we're, we're still developing. So having that connection with investment is, is really important. I mean, grant funding, of course, is always incredibly important to, to startups. Mm. But what I've always loved about um, you know, the CEFC, ARENA, various other um, independent government agencies is that they look at investment from a good economic standpoint, mm. which means that the viability of the businesses that they are putting this money into um, stack up against more traditional investments. And that's in incredibly important to how uh, startups, both in this region and more broadly, are, are invested into. So having someone on the ground, but that is also using really savvy um, business analysis, unit economic modelling, all that sort of thing um, for those investments is only going to make sure that this region has more and more successful startups that scale up and, mm. and, and uh, contribute to our economy. I mean, governments have problems uh, with funds like this if they are investment funds because they're worried about losing money and getting <laughs> you know, beaten up in the media for losing money. So. Sure. They off, governments often prefer to do grants, like ARENA does, so sure. the money's lost from the minute you write the cheque. You know? <laughs> so, 
uh, CEFC is, has to get a return and, you know, actually has been a very, very successful investment Fund. bank, I That's suppose. Right. Uh, yeah. But, um, you Funneling know... it through other investment, you know, yeah. as governments have done with Artesian and various others, you yeah. know, you can do a similar kind of exactly. style to that. Exactly, yeah. you can provide incentives and, and I mean, yeah, we started the, you know, the CSIRO fund that uh, Main Sequence Ventures of now, course, yes. yep. now uh, manages. Look, um, yeah, I mean, the, the startup economy is of enormous benefit. I mean, practically nobody loses out of it, by the way, hmm. because, you know, if you have a startup, um, you know, the investors may often lose some money, but they'll learn something out from it, but they'll lose a bit of money. The founder, the founder and the people who work in the startup will learn a huge amount and even if it doesn't work go on to do something even better um, and you know it just it just builds an ecosystem I mean it is really one of the most positive things you can have a startup ecosystem you know so I, I used to get rubbished in the media when I was uh, in politics for being so focused on this but it, you know it was not just romantic romanticizing you know brilliant young, not always young, but you know, generally brilliant young scientists and technologists and engineers. It's, it, it is, there is an element of romance to it, but I promise you, it is from a hard-headed economic point of view, it's hugely additive and uh, very beneficial, of course, to any city or community in which it's going on. Yeah, and I think in the power space, it's also exactly where people will innovate and will be forced mm. to look at things differently. So when we are looking at a at a you know a green energy future, it is the startups that, that will that will scale with that investment yeah. that um, mm. that will come at it from a different angle, which is exactly what we need. So why not be the region that's promoting um, that those sorts of approaches? Absolutely, mm. totally, totally. So we have um, time for one more question, and I'd like to get a response uh, from a couple of people on the panel on this one. So the Hunter, it's a region with such a deep relationship with coal mining over generations. In fact. Uh, Nick, you've been part of that and have chosen a different pathway. How do we encourage and persuade others to support a future powered by renewable energy? Nick, if you could give your response and then we'll finish. Um, Malcolm, I appreciate your insights on this question. Uh, yeah, well, my, my grandfather was a mechanical engineer as well. He designed high pressure steam systems for um, coal fired power stations. Uh, and I've sort of inherited his, his love of energy and, and machines. Uh, and taken, taken my own pathway through university. Universities are really forward-looking, fundamentally, uh, and they're preparing the workforce, people, and communities for the future as well as the present. Uh, so I, I followed in my grandfather's footsteps and did mechanical engineering, but uh, I'm working on... Uh, I did my PhD on Australian flow battery technology, uh, and now I'm here at University of Newcastle working on hydrogen. Uh, and that's really focused on delivering um, or looking at opportunities for community and industry in this region, in, in Australia, in the world, to deliver value. Mm. So as you say, Malcolm, people really are our most important resource as we sure. face uh, and, and conquer this challenge and thrive. Um, how do we encourage and persuade others to support this future um, whose families might be impacted? Yeah, well, well, I mean, they're going to be impacted. You know, the... Uh um, you know that you, you may not be interested in the energy transition, but it's interested in you. To uh, paraphrase somebody else, uh, but the um, the the fact is, it's happening. As we've, as I think we all recognise, it's very clear. So the question is, are you going to just you know go down with the coal ship, as it were, or are you going to be uh, looking at the successor technologies? Uh, and and get get in ahead on that, or are you, or are you just going to, you know, in effect, be left behind? And I mean, look, any there's no the, the the problem that we have is the way uh, this issue has been turned into a values or identity issue. And I mean, even intelligent people do this. I mean, I don't know if you saw Insiders on Sunday, but David Spears, who's not a not a dope or anything like that. David Spears said to uh, Terry Butler, who's the Labor environment spokesperson, he said, Do you, are you in favour of more gas or less gas? I mean, this is fuel fetishism. You know, the answer is, I want to, the answer should be, I want to see us 
move to zero emissions as soon as we can and at the same time have affordable and reliable energy as we move through that. And whether at different times we use more or less gas, you know, we'll, we could use more gas for a period than we do now, and then, you know, at the end of it, you'd want to use less. But it is, you know, we've, we, we, we've got to sort of, you know, this, it's not a, it isn't coal or being pro-coal or anti-coal or saying coal's bad. Coal has no moral qualities at all. It's a thing, right? It has certain characteristics, physical characteristics. And what we've got the opportunity to do is to have cheaper electricity, which is also clean. Now, how can you possibly knock that back? So the question is, how do we get there? And given that we know that's where we're heading, the next question is, do we want to be going there too? Because, and if the answer to that is not yes, then you're basically saying, I want to be left behind, and nobody wants that. So I reckon this is a, I, I, you know, I think this is a, we've got to take the politics and the values and the identity politics and rubbish ideology out of it, focus on the facts and the physics, and the opportunity is enormous uh, for the hunter. Thank you. That's brought us to the end of our panel session. The Vice-Chancellor is going to close the event today. Oh, thank you. Good afternoon. As Vice-Chancellor, it's my pleasure to provide some final remarks and offer a vote of thanks to the Honourable Malcolm Turnbull and to our panellists. Um, it's uh, really been, I've got to say, when we found out we had the opportunity to invite Malcolm to, to the university and give a, a lecture, I thought, we've got to find a way to make it public. <laughs> I feel so good to be back amongst people like this and uh, it's the first event we've really done like this all year so it's been a long time and, this, and somehow we've blended it with the online so there's another 300 people out there listening and uh, contributing but uh, somehow it feels different to do it face to face so I'm really yeah. a great way to bring, it back, bring us back together Malcolm yeah, so thank you is. for that. So w when we host these um, lectures, we want to bring the community together to talk about issues of importance to our region. We want to provide a space to debate challenging ideas, and we were challenged tonight about the very future of this region, what, based on the history of where we've come from. So we also aim to talk about what's possible for the future, and more importantly, how can we get there? And I think today's event certainly delivered that. Our region and nation will need to make changes to embrace a low carbon future. And it's clear from the discussions there's both an environmental and economic imperative to act. The Hunter region has been sustained by traditional energy sources. We have the industrial capacity and workforce to pivot and play a major role in the new energy economy. I'm very proud that our university is working closely with our region to play a part for the, in this future. Through our research, industry, engagement initiatives like the Hunter Hydrogen Task Force, we are building capacity for change. It was a real privilege to hear from the Honourable Malcolm Turnbull on this importance of this issue to our region. So Malcolm, as one of our nation's esteemed leaders, we appreciated your insights. As always, it was plain speaking, at times very blunt, but very clear what we need to do. You know, climate change is a reality. Coal is in transition. And for us to be a clean energy powerhouse, we must embrace the future. And I think uh, when you think about legacies of a Prime Minister, I think you couldn't think of something better than Snowy 2.0. That will be there, for, I think, for centuries to come. Mm. So it's something I think you can look back on, and I think it was your leadership that got it through, because there was a lot of opposition to it. I remember reading all the various articles about why it wasn't the right project and will it have the payback, etc. But it's very clear we really need it. So thank you for what you've done there. So here in the Hunter, we share your optimism for the future. We agree that this is an opportunity ahead to take the right steps now, and. Uh, Thank you for those insightful remarks. So, Malcolm and Lucy Turnbull, it's been an honour to uh, host you on our campus today. On behalf of the university and the Newcastle community, I extend a sincere thank you for making the journey to the university and to Newcastle, and thank you for your interest in our university and our region. I know you have a local farm, and not far up there in the Upper Hunter, but and you visit regularly, so we, we hope that you can come again, because very, we're very grateful for the generosity that you gave us with this visit. 
certainly very much enjoy, personally enjoyed the interactions. So we hope to invite you back again and see you more in the region and to talk about the work we hopefully kicked off tonight because certainly the Committee of the Hunter and I know the University will very much like to start to build the momentum on what was discussed tonight. So to the panellists, so thank you firstly Alice for your terrific moderation, that was great, and facilitating an engaging conversation. Your knowledge of the region and policy landscapes I think really shaped the discussion well. So thank you. I'd also like to thank Alan, uh, Sorrell and Nicholas for a great panel discussion. Uh, Alan, it's certainly the points you made around the skill base and the capabilities of the Hunter and the University were well made. Uh, Sorrell, I think, you know, their startups are a vibrant part of the Hunter and certainly we need them in the energy space and I think Diffuse Energy is a spin-off of our university. We're very proud of what you guys are doing and keep up the great work. And Nicholas, thank you to talk about innovation and the big picture uh, areas of where we can go uh, with these new alternatives to carbon energy. So we, and it was great to hear that people were actually sending in questions. So we appreciate your views and uh, I think certainly there's a lot to consider tonight. So there's been a lot of people working behind the scenes at the university to organise this event and the, today's program. So thanks very much to our, our corporate events team. You're brilliant. Uh, and thank you to our colleagues at Wallatuka, the Newcastle Institute of Energy and Resources, Hunter Wise and MGA Thermal for sharing your time with us today and talk, to, talking about your work. I also acknowledge our infrastructure team. We, we was, security was here, plain clothes. They've kept very, everything moving along nicely. The health response units, our ushers, our social distancing champions and colleagues from the university have supported today's event. So thank you very much. It's a great turnout. So thank you for all your contributions. But um, So tonight we really saw the brilliance of Malcolm Turnbull in full display. So I, I really always enjoy listening to him. I've got to say, I do commend you his uh, aptly titled autobiography, A Bigger Picture. And it's sort of, you can hear about, you know, we heard about the, you can see the lawyer, the business person, the politician, and all those stories are told in the same straightforward, unvarnished way. But, uh, but what I think I really enjoyed about that uh, autobiography was the, the partnership he has with his wife, Lucy. It really is something truly remarkable, a true partnership, very inspiring. So uh, thank you for that, Malcolm. So, and uh, well, so I want to finally f finish off to say that um, those of you who are online, thank you for joining us. As a university of the region, for the region, we value your participation in these events. And uh, thank you for taking the time on Melbourne Cup Day, of all days. But uh, we <laughs> hope that you enjoyed the lecture and the opportunity to hear from Malcolm Turnbull. And you've all contributed to the success of this event. I'm really pleased we had a COVID safe model for these type of events in future. So this is the trial. In fact, we hope to run our graduations in the same way going forward. So once again, please join me in a final round of applause to Malcolm Turnbull and our speakers. And I'll hand back to Janet to close the event. Thank you. Thank you, Alex, for those warm words.